Welcome, my friends. Welcome, Anthony. Welcome, Blocks. Welcome, Eric. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Anthony and Eric, for being together with us since 2013, our first conference. Yes. And, and, and I think you enjoyed it as much as we did because you kept coming. I don't know why you kept coming to our events. And Brock, you also are like a, like a friend of LaBitConf because you've joined us, I think, since 2017. But you've also been always very active and related and connected to us. So thank you, Brock, for, for joining us to, today again. Yes? But uh, are you listening well? Uh, let's do like this if you listen to me. Yeah. yeah? Great. Guys. This is an OGs, yes, all gangsters, or I don't know, original, <laughs> original gangsters team. Uh, and, and I think that I, I would like to introduce your, yourself to introduce why you are originals. I know I would like especially let's start uh, introduced by, by Brock Pierce, yes, because he's been in this way, way beyond even being Bitcoin. No, he's been in this, I, I know you've been in the digital currencies uh, for way, way, way back. So I, I would like you to give us, all of us, give a, a, an introduction of how you did all this, uh, which was your story in the Bitcoin space or in the, in the crypto space, okay? Um, yeah, yeah, so I got my start um, pre-Bitcoin uh, in the context of collectibles. You know, think Magic the Gathering cards. And as persistent worlds and video games emerged where you had, um, you know, collectibles or assets or digital currency in these things, I, I became a market maker. Uh, and that became a pretty big business by 2001, 2002. Uh, I became the, uh, we were the main market makers for World of Warcraft gold and Linden dollars and Second Life. We built up the supply chain of about 400,000 people, principally in China, that played video games professionally to mine digital currency for us. We were PayPal's largest merchant for years. We were instrumental in launching Alipay in China. We rolled up South Korea, where we did over a billion dollars a year uh, as the main exchange for uh, digital currencies. And so that was my, my 20s in the 2000s. And we were really experimenting with economic theories because you couldn't really test out economic theories in the, in the analog or default world because the risk of causing harm was too high. But in a video game world on a server, the worst thing that happens is, um, you know, you lose a server and you spin up another one. And so uh, a lot of economists came and spent time with us to get uh, tenured into universities. And so I was very eager to, to get into this space, wanting to see if we could test out some of these ideas in the default or analog world. I became a, a full-time participant in this ecosystem in 2012. Um, I think very visibly by 2013, uh, just a few of the projects I was involved with that are notable is uh, uh, MasterCoin, where we uh, uh, created the first ever ICO, though we didn't call it at the time. Uh, this was in the uh, spring and summer of 2013. Uh, started uh, co-founded Blockchain Capital, the first venture fund dedicated to the space. Uh, started Tether, where we uh, digitized the U.S. dollar. Uh, most people are not looking at the numbers of that, but it's doing about $100 billion uh, a day in transactional volume right now, which is about 30 or $40 trillion. Uh, dollars a year, started the first crypto bank down in Puerto Rico in 2014. Uh, we created the first security token with BCAP or Blockchain Capital's third fund. Um, uh, did Block One or EOS, which obviously was the biggest of the ICOs. And there's about 50 other projects, but uh, I don't want to run on too long. Uh, I think of myself as sort of a, a, a doula for creation. Uh, sometimes they're my ideas, sometimes they're yours. And what excites me most is the process of, uh, uh, of creation and I run along and do the next thing. But my focus these days uh, is really spent in Puerto Rico. Uh, my focus is in uh, governance and uh, the systems that govern over us uh, societally and the intersection of where that will meet uh, technology. And so I'm in the, uh, uh, the final days of a 2020 U.S. presidential run. I ran for president in this election cycle, and uh, I've completed basic training. Uh, and I just turned 40. That all? Yes, and about your experience and what you learned from it in, in right now after we, we close the introductions. Bueno, Anthony, I will let you be the second one, yes? 
uh, I, I really see you as also someone that really started lots of projects and, and did like the full circle. No? You, you started very actively and, and now you already like went beyond this. No? So, so I, I would like to know, to let the people know your, your past in the space. Yes, how, how you started and, and really what did you build from, from scratch uh, well, in this time? So I got in the space in 2012. Um, prior to that, uh, I've been in computers all my life since I was an eight-year-old building computers when the, the, uh, the first PC computer started, started coming out. And I was just enthralled by, by, by computers growing up and modems before the internet and bulletin board systems and just everything for me, my life was, was tech and computers. And I went to school for business. I didn't want to get into computers or be a programmer, but I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, so I took uh, kind of each decade was something very interesting to me. I had the, the first decade was, was getting into computers and then, then the internet came along and then kind of learning entrepreneurship in, in the 2000s. And then uh, in 2008 and the crisis that happened in the U.S. I'm from Toronto, not from the U.S., but looking to see what had, what had happened there and the problems and started looking at, at economics and started becoming enthralled with economics, which was something I hadn't really taken much interest in the past. Um, and then just uh, just to digging into the Austrian school of economics and the different way of, of looking at uh, things that we were never taught before. And from there, it was, OK, what do I do with this knowledge that I've learned and, and what I've seen happen? And and that's when I heard of Bitcoin. Uh, I heard about Bitcoin on a radio show called Free Talk Live. Eric, I think the same with same with you as a Free Talk Live that, that got you in where you heard it first. Very familiar with Free Talk Live, but that's not where I heard it. Got it. I think maybe it was maybe it was Charlie that or some others, but it, it, it's been a it's been a, a show that uh, all about freedom. And I was getting into the freedom movement and uh, listening to a guy named Peter Schiff, who I had followed for a while. And and I always say, if it wasn't for Peter Schiff, I would have never gotten into Bitcoin, uh, which is ironic considering his his view on on, on Bitcoin, or at least the, what his view was. I don't know if he's still thinking the same thing, but um, I I. You know, studying economics, and then it's like, okay, well, what do, what can I do from this? What do I, what, what can I, you know, how do I make a difference here? And then I heard about Bitcoin, and I took my computer background, my economics background, my entrepreneurial background, and and said, how can I? This is something I'm super interested in, and how do I, how do I start looking to see what I, what I can do in this space? Um, when the internet started out, it was very difficult with my age to really take uh, or to utilize what was going on there. Uh, that's when I was going through university, but. When crypto came out, or when I heard about Bitcoin, I think that I was just ripe from my past experiences and putting it all together to say, "Let's build." And um, I had someone that uh, reached out to me on Reddit, and and uh, a couple of days later, we got together. It was a developer named Steve Dack. Flew down to New Jersey, met up with him. We were like, "What are we going to do? Let's let's create some value here." We're we're super excited about this, and uh, we decided to to say, "How can we make some money now to do this?" And we got into the gambling space. Uh, we, we, we took lead from a, 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 a very important uh, site called Satoshi Dice and said, let's, let's make this graphical thing and, and, and get into gambling and make some money so we can do something really important. And that was kind of the, the genesis. It wasn't that we, we really appreciated gambling or really wanted to, to do that, but we, we were enthralled by provably fair gaming. We were enthralled by, by um, you know, not uh, at the time being able to not have to go through the traditional systems for people to play. They could just deposit Bitcoin and play and then withdraw it. So started doing that and it took off right away. Uh, at the same time, made some investments at, at well under 10 bucks uh, in Bitcoin. And then very soon after, um, selling the company a few months in because I'd started a nonprofit organization that didn't want to be involved in gambling anymore, ended up selling it. And then from that and from my initial investments, uh, started building wallets and realizing that the wallet is the interface for this whole technology, just like the browser is the interface for the, for the internet. It enables people to move and manage value like the, inter the browser enables the masses to manage and move uh, information. So realizing that if we could get everybody needs to, to, to navigate and use the space and uh, launched a product called CryptoKit, Steve and I did. Um, and about a, a month, uh, or while we were doing that, uh, Vitalik, who I had met at the very first Toronto Bitcoin meetup group that I put on back in 2012, uh, and who I'd gotten to know over the year, in, this was in 2013, he presented the white paper for Ethereum to me. Um, it was in many places over my head. Uh, and I, I, I showed it to somebody that, that I'd gotten to know doing a lot of uh, ambassador work for Bitcoin, uh, Charles Hoskinson. 
showed him the paper and he was floored by it, got the validation of that, introduced Charles to Vitalik. And then uh, along with Amir Chetrit and Mihai Alizeev, the five of us got together and, and with the funding of, of what I got from Satoshi Circle and from my investments, I, I funded the initial uh, project before we did the crowd sale. And the five of us um, started this crazy journey called Ethereum back in, in late 2013. So that was kind of, uh, you know, a lot of people know the story after that. Um, it was a really rocky battle for the first few months. Uh, we, we added a few more founders in, in Gavin Wood and, and um, um, uh, Jeffrey Wilkie and also, um, oh geez, got a blank on me right now. My apologies. But we started the, uh, we added some more after that and, and kicked off and started this massive crowd sale process and, and launched it and the rest is kind of history. Um, after that, went back on creating wallets. Uh, we launched a product called Jax in 2016 and uh, Jax Liberty in 2018, which is a new version of it. And currently I sit as CEO of that project, uh, continuing to build out infrastructure for Jax, scalable infrastructure that's gonna uh, provide enterprise clients the ability to, to start, start building on top of the different chains that we support. And we're just, about ready to get into growth mode for once and start doing user acquisition of Jax. And now that our infrastructure is scalable and in the place that we want it to be, uh, it's time to start start moving on that. Um, so that's my initial story. Uh, in the, um, that's how I got into the space. A lot of community building, a lot of bringing people together and just, just ideas flourishing and, and getting involved. And I've invested in a ton of projects. I was very early on with Quantum and, and VeChain, a lot of the Pride Chinese projects. Uh, so that, that's my initial story. I, I have you more like like one of these uh, very fun to the Austrian economics. Yes, I think that you your way into understanding Bitcoin had to do with your way of understanding uh, liberty, freedom, and 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 power distribution stuff like that. So, which was your story, and and what's behind it? Why you decided to really put yourself into this beyond the economic aspects? No. Eric, can I just interrupt, sorry, for one second? I am really sorry, I, I did not mean this. Uh, Joseph Lubin, the eighth person, ah, I'm Joseph, really yeah. sorry. I did not mean that, I just threw a blank for a second. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah, all right. Um, so I learned about Bitcoin when I was in New Hampshire as part of the Free State Project. Um, and I learned about the Free State Project actually from Free Talk Live. Uh, it was essentially a very radical idea of moving a bunch of um, extreme libertarians into one confined geographic region so as to um, as to express a high degree of you know political influence essentially um, so I've been you know a lifelong proponent of individual liberty and uh, while I was in New Hampshire I learned from a friend there about Bitcoin and fortunately I understood its its value almost immediately, like within 30 minutes. Uh, and the reason was that I, I had been lamenting the fact that, uh, that money itself was centrally controlled, that money was essentially a tool of the state. Um, I am a capitalist and I always thought it was a huge embarrassment that the central good or the most important good in a capitalistic system would be centrally planned by the government. That seems completely antithetical, but there was not really a good alternative before Bitcoin. So when I learned about Bitcoin, um, I said, ah, this could be it. This could be the way that uh, actually market actors can interact with each other free of the course of influence of states. And this would not just be good for New Hampshire where I was living, but this would actually be good for the entire world. So it, it just had the, the impact and scale potential that was um, immense. I fell in love with it. I, it became my hobby, my passion, my career. Um, early project I was involved in was, was BitInstant. So I was the, the third employee there, I moved down to New York City to join Charlie Shrem, who sadly couldn't be on this call with us today. Um, and uh, basically we helped people move fiat money uh, quickly into Mt. Gox because that was a Japanese exchange that would take one or two weeks to wire money to. So we, we helped people get it in in like one or two hours instead of one or two weeks. And uh, also during that time, I started Satoshi Dice. And that was a little side project that kind of got carried away, uh, turned into the biggest 
Bitcoin gambling game in the world. It was half of all the Bitcoin transactions um, up until 2013. And um, I decided I needed to sell that because I didn't think that I could be an outspoken proponent of Bitcoin and also be running the world's largest gambling site at the same time. Um, so that was kind of tragic to have to sell something that was so so fun and exciting and had been so successful. But um, I felt like what I needed to contribute to to cryptocurrency generally was was not really about gambling. It was really about showing the world why open money is so important. And so um, ever since then, I've been focused on on that. Um, today, I run Shapeshift. Shapeshift has been around for about six and a half years. Um, started out as a simple and easy way to trade one digital asset into another. And um, today, we, we advocate self-custody above all things. So if you understand crypto, you understand why it's important to hold your own keys. That is where your sovereignty over your wealth comes from. And um, Shapeshift makes that very easy for people. So that's, that's my quick story. I'll hand it back to you, Rodolfo. So actually, this brings me to, to two different aspects. First, uh, just a brief summary. Yes, I've been here before all of you. Yes, I've been here since 1997 with the Bitcoins project. I, since the year 2000, I hold the bitcoins.com domain. Uh, it was a World Wide Web eCash was the project, but it never seen the light until I talked with Satoshi and he created this other version of Bitcoin. Yes, in 2008. No, <laughs> but actually he launched this, this project and I had this big domain and I, I always think it's not about what you have but what you do with what you have, no? And this is what I see from your side also. It's like all of you had different situations which brought you into being spontaneously big players in the space, yes? But you did, you built on top of that, yes? So, so I think it's, it's fun to see people, oh, yes, because he was from here earlier or he had this opportunity, but it's always about what people <laughs> does with the opportunities they are given. And, and you talked about magic, yes? No, sorry, not about magic. You talked about uh, Mount Gox, yes? And I know that somehow Brock Pierce is related to this story. I don't know if Mount Gox, I think you are related to Mount Gox too. Yes, two times at the beginning and later. You will correct me. But it has to do with magic, no? With the magic cards gathering of, I don't remember the name, uh, of magic gathering, magic, magic gathering of, of trading cards, something like that. So, Brock, why don't you let us know a bit about your, your also pass in the magic uh, and, and uh, empty Gox? Well, yeah, so Mount Gox. Uh, stands for Magic the Gathering Online uh, Exchange. And so it was meant to be a, uh, a site for trading the online version of uh, uh, the game's cards. Uh, it was started by Jed McCaleb, who went off to start um, Ripple, and then after Ripple to start Stellar, which is his current project. Um, it wasn't really a business, wasn't really incorporated. Let's call it his first foray into development and entrepreneurship. Um, uh, uh, Mark Karpelis was an early uh, uh, player in Bitcoin. He bought the business uh, or project uh, from Jed McCaleb and then was running it from Japan. I uh, was operating the largest virtual currency exchanges for video games at the time. And so my main investor was Goldman Sachs. And I went to my board in uh, 2012 and said, we should buy Mt. Gox. And my, uh, because I think we need to get into the Bitcoin business. We can't really grow anymore in our current business. We have 90, 95% market share. And so if we want to keep growing, we got to expand into other verticals. Uh, my board laughed at me. Uh, they're like, Brock, I mean, Bitcoin, are you crazy? <laughs> I said, actually, you know, this is going to be a thing. And, um, and I said, let me send you some research. Let me get you some information and, and, and we'll talk about it at the next board meeting and where I was chairman. I came back to the next board meeting and said, okay, I want to buy Mt. Gox. I want to get us into Bitcoin. Uh, they laughed at me again. And I'm like, what <laughs> did any of you guys bother to read the materials I sent to you? And, um, uh, uh, Brad Stevens was on my board. Uh, one of the co-founders of Blockchain Capital with me because they had been invested in my virtual currency business since 2004. I called them up after the board meeting. And I said, it's OK for Goldman Sachs to dismiss this and and the other Wall Street sort of players and financial players. But you guys run the biggest video game hedge fund in the world. You play these games. You understand virtual currency. You understand this business. And we're friends. Did you read any of the materials I sent you? And they're like, no, I go. 
I'm really just, dis- it's one thing to disagree with me, but it's another to like poop poop an idea without having done any of your homework. I'm really disappointed as friends. This is kind of important. And I gave them a very, very hard time, which is then what led to them actually taking a serious look at Bitcoin, which is eventually what led to the creation of blockchain capital. Um, but I eventually went to my board and said, okay, well, if you're not going to, if you're not interested in me um, uh, buying Mount Gox on behalf of the business, I'd like to have the ability to pursue this personally. I went to go do that. Uh, I went and did that with my good friend, Malcolm Cassell, who unfortunately just passed away at 50 years old. Um, and we went and entered into an agreement to, uh, 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 to, we didn't enter into an agreement. We fully negotiated a deal uh, to buy Mt. Gox. And then we switched it to run the, the joint venture uh, in China. And so we were launching Mt. Gox.cn. Uh, this is in, I think, early 2013. And uh and lined up all the money, built out the management team. And then I was like laying in bed going, do I, something just tells me something isn't right here. Um, I just, I, 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 I don't trust the competency of the management team. I don't trust the competency of the, 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 the technology. And something in my gut just said, don't do the deal. And so I pulled the plug on the Mountain Gox, Gox deal, basically, you know, days before it was meant to close uh, for Fortunately, my intuition was right. And then there's an important lesson in life here. Don't do things because you can do things because you should. Um, and uh, I dodged a bullet. I was giving a speech at Jason Kalkanis's uh, launch event um, in San Francisco. The first time they had anyone speak about Bitcoin. I come off the stage and my float- phone is blowing up and people are like, Mount Gox has just collapsed. It's going under. I, I called up Mark Carpellis uh, from the launch conference. And I said, Hey, Mark, I want to buy Mt. Gox. He goes, are you not paying attention to the news? I go, yeah, that's why I'm calling. And he goes, and you're still interested. I go, I am, but, uh, you know, the deal terms will have changed. Um, (laughs) and, uh, uh, I think you're going to need some help here, uh, uh, to keep yourself from going to jail. He's like, uh, yes, please help me. And so that night I negotiated a deal uh, to buy Mt. Gox for $1 um, and to take over to come in and clean up the business. Uh, I was feeling very generous. And so by the time we signed the definitive uh, uh, agreement, the binding agreement, uh, I, I changed it to one Bitcoin, which at the time was about a 460x increase in the purchase price. Um, and uh, so did that and went to get involved in trying to uh, uh, salvage the business, uh, uh, to, to collect as many Bitcoin as possible for the benefit of creditors. And my reason for doing this was not because I saw an opportunity. I was really concerned about the industry. And this was, uh, for those of you that were around at the time, Mt. Gox collapsing was like the worst thing that could possibly happen for Bitcoin at the time. In the end, I think it's been, you know, it's been okay for those that didn't have coins there, but, um, when the industry learned a lot from those, uh, those, those lessons, um, but uh, it, it went into a Japanese bankruptcy. Uh, I was fighting for rehabilitation over liquidation. It became a liquidation. And so there really wasn't anything you can do because the Japanese courts effectively take over. And so I sat back. And then as the price of Bitcoin increased again, I went back to get involved to try and steer the bankruptcy courts into basically getting everyone their Bitcoin faster. Um, you know, my view was now that there was a lot of money there, uh, you had Coin Lab, which is another old business in the space that was trying to, they felt that the Bitcoin belonged to them, uh, that they had been wronged by the Mount Gox business. I disagreed with that. And I wanted to make sure that all of the people that lost their Bitcoin got everything they could as fast as they possibly could. And so I've been very involved in the Mount Gox saga uh, for, I'd like for to know the, time and it's, the sorry the, the rest did did you been involved somehow this uh, empty Gox? did you lose anything in empty Gox? did you had any any situation related to this story uh, Eric or or uh, Anthony nope. you were like safe I mean, there were lost. you playing in, in trade hill at that time I've never used exchanges I, I just I just no I've never lost lost funds or kept funds on anything that I would be worried about losing Okay. I, I lost money there. Uh, <laughs> however, um, I lost brave, brave, to brave to but, say, brave to say. But and I, I have a great T-shirt. It just says "Goxed" on it, and Goxed. I wear that around through the airports and everything, and no one's ever 
come up to me to give you me a hug. You could be gox or sao tongued. No, we had these two, two different <laughs> versions of being gox. Do you remember sao tongue? Of course. I, yes. I actually lost money on Bitcoinica, but that, uh, that was my own fault for trading on margin. That was, that was not his fault on that one. Um, <laughs> okay. But with, with Gox, certainly I knew that that ship was going down and it was very risky. And I was telling other people not to store money there. And I had money there briefly, but that brief window was uh, the wrong window to choose. So go, goes in the list of stories. <laughs> yes. Bueno, but this is the other aspect that raised uh, from your talk, Eric, that raised to me, which is the political aspect. And I know Brock could talk a lot about his political uh, approach, but I, I want to understand if you think that money is power, yes, if you think that distributing, helping others to get into Bitcoin is about helping uh, in a way to distribute power also, if you're concerned about power being, being concentrated in some hands, and also if you think that somehow we, the ones who are free from the beginning and, the, and, and people who is holder and stuff, might try to become like, like change, the, change things now that they can. No? You, Brock, tried to run as a president, and I, I really think this is one of the, of the things that might happen. No, it's running as a president is a huge thing, <laughs> but, I mean, but I mean, it's like you get empowered. No? I mean, it's, how do you feel Bitcoin and power, Bitcoin and, and distribution? I, I would like to have your, your thoughts on that, if, if it's possible. Eventually, yeah. Eric first, and then we go, we move. Yeah. Uh, I'm not so concerned about distributions of power. Um, I'm concerned about the character of power. And what I mean by that is um, the, the richest person in the world uh, doesn't frighten me or bother me or harm me in any way. Um, but a, a lowly clerk within government can make my life hell. And the reason that one doesn't bother me and the other does is because one actually has the ability to use coercion and violence in enacting their opinions. Um, whereas the other one can only trade and exchange uh, mutually with people. So um, my concern with power is, is that when people are in government, they have the ability to hurt, imprison, kill, steal from, those kind of things. Uh, and I think most of the evil in the world comes from that type of behavior. Um, so the reason that, that Bitcoin is wonderful in that context isn't because it will change any distributions of power. What it, what it does is that it moves money itself out of the realm of coercive power and into the realm of everyone being able to use it and interact with it openly. And that, that's what I find so so special about it. Anthony? <clears throat> ah, sorry. Well, so I, I, I think that guy that has the wealthiest guy in the world, that individual in the current situation does have the ability to influence those people in government with the money he has. So I could be concerned with him as well, not just the guy that's in government. So I don't know if the just the people in government are, are what needs to be worried about there, but I, I, I do have concerns with someone who is with, with all this money is not realizing he has the opportunity to do great amounts of good. And that's what his goal is to, is to take what he's gotten and, and create as Brock kind of pushed into my head a couple of years ago, you know, compounding impact. I mean, that's, that to me is the goal. That's, that's something since he told me that a couple of years ago, uh, I was teaching a class that he came in and, 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 and did a guest presentation here in Toronto at the university of Toronto. And, and it, it really stuck with me is, is, is that shift has to happen. We have to move away from the incentive structures of, of, and these business models that, that are about, to me, it's about making as much wealth as you can, but it's not a good formula that people are using. And you end up, you end up displacing others. It, 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 it needs to be uh, better business models that lead to positive impact, which in turn will get you the wealth you want is, is my belief. And I think that that flow needs to happen. We need to, show that it is possible for you to do amazing things for people and create so much impact and you'll get what you want out of that. If you do it the other way around, you're creating this, this, these, these situations where only a few people are winning, including yourself and not, and not you know, 100% of the population. And it just takes extra brain power to get to that 100%, I believe. 
I believe most 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 um, of these incentive models they're deficient. These business models are deficient, and they're they're only sufficing a lot of the people that are involved, and not the rest of the population. So, uh, I think that 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 if we have a person in power that has all that wealth, but he has the opportunity and he has the desire and drive to create positive impact for everybody, I think that's an amazing thing. Uh, and I think that's what I want to start working towards. And, and, and crypto is one aspect of it. I, I'm not as enthused about the space anymore. It's not as sexy as it was to me back in the day. And it's, it's, I, want, I want part of that to be what I do. But I think most of it is how do we create that, that compounding impact that Brock's talked about in the past and I talk about now. And I think, I think showing people that by you doing that, you will get what you want and you can provide a new way of looking at things that's beyond the traditional business models that, that most of the world runs on. And it leads to the greed and leads to these terrible situations that we see happening in all these different sectors of the world. But I, I feel very related to what you're saying and actually it's what moves me. Yes, it's what it's been making me build all these projects and, and usually related to helping people to understand and know and not I'm not in the business side I'm more in the, the social side but but yes I, I feel deeply moved with with your way of thinking also and Brock you've run for president yes so I guess you have uh, your, your approach I, I guess you didn't expect it to get elected yes first time and, and whatever but I guess you try to move an agenda no you you why? Why did you did this? Why you was running for president? And eventually, I guess you will keep running for president till you become a president. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so I had zero um, expectations <laughs> that I would be winning this election. Um, actually, it's impossible uh, uh, for me to win. So I didn't run with the intention of winning. I ran with two principal intentions. One was to deliver a message. Uh, a presidential platform is a, a, a very empowering platform to deliver a message, uh, policy ideas, uh, a different way of thinking um, at a time where I think we needed a very different message. Also, uh, it was an exploratory mission to prepare me for a, a, a future run. And how does one learn how to run for president? Uh, there's not really any classes on this. Um, there's really no way to learn other than by doing it. And I didn't want to start at the bottom of the, uh, the sort of political ladder and work my way up. Uh, and so I did it the uh, uh, one of the most challenging ways possible, which is just to go right in and run for president. <laughs> um, and it's the ultimate arena, right? It's the Coliseum of Coliseums. Uh, it can cost you your life, it can cost you your liberty, it can cost you everything you have. It's a, it's a very high risk um, uh, uh, exploration, but I fortunately exited the arena unscathed, actually cleansed and uh, uh, empowered. Uh, I didn't run a negative campaign, so I've got uh, relationships on all sides of the political spectrum right now. And it's gotten me a seat at the table uh, to really deliver some major impact. My view is that, uh, uh, you know, we can, you know, whatever your view is, I, I look at the government or the government government as the system that governs over us as, uh, uh, as something that we can run. Um, you know, the future is going to happen to you or it's going to happen with you. Um, we have a, a, a democratic process in this country and if enough of us get involved, we can be the government. I believe it is our birthright to an, to in, it is our birthright to inherit this government, um, our generation that is. And the question is, which of us are willing to volunteer uh, to step into service? Um, I think it's much better to change the system from the inside than it is from the outside. And I'm looking for another 100 volunteers that want to run for political office over the next couple of years uh, so I can continue with my training. Um, and so if you want to run for city council, mayor, state senate, congress, you know, or a federal uh, sort of role, uh, let me know. Uh, I'm just looking for people that are showing up in service, people that care about our collective future and that are not doing it for money or power. You know, I want to see a government of, for, and by the people because uh, I think we're doomed if we don't do something different. I think it's time for some real change, and that means some very different people with new ideas. New leadership, Brock. That's, that's, we need more of you out there. Yes, I think that it's, it, it's courage. Yes, I, the, the one that you showed is, is courage to everyone. Yes, and I, I really uh, take my hat off for what you did. Uh, so, guys, we are finishing. 
I'm sorry, this was not a content. This was just a chat, a fireside chat, eventually, among four of us. Yes, I really enjoy having this kind of talks. I really appreciate you joining us. Yes, it's not easy to get you all three and four. Charlie, eventually, he couldn't come. But get you all together and, and be willing to spend these 45 minutes just talking. But I really appreciate you do this. And, and really, I appreciate that you always follow us in, in every live comes. So thank you again. Thank you for joining. And I hope to see you soon, wherever in, in the world we, we met, and eventually coming down to Argentina if you want. Yes, you're always widely invited. Thank you again. Thanks for the, love you guys. Thank you. Love you guys, man. Take care.